I am mindful as I begin to share with you this morning of words that a mentor shared with me when I was getting ready to pastor in my first kind of uh, solo appointment as a pastor. I'd been an associate for three years, and as I was preparing to go to this church where I would uh, be the, the only pastor, my mentor shared, Michael, uh, during your initial time at that church, I, I'd like you to think that you have two primary goals. Uh, one of those is to love the people, and the second is to preach good news. Love the people and preach good news. You make the loving the people part easy. You are a very easy people to love. You're very kind. You're very gracious. And, and the preaching the good news, that's... Uh, that has become natural for me as well. And so what happened is, uh, uh, some time before coming here, I began to pray on and uh, ask God, God, what, what good news would you have me to bring during my initial time at Christ by the Sea? And uh, I was led to the book of Mark, and I just began, see, as I was reading through carefully and slowly, Lord, what, what stories of these are the most good newsy for the people of this community? What are going to be the stories that lift up that which we need to hear to know that, that the gospel means good news for God's people and for the people of this world. And so uh, we are in week four of that now, and I'm thrilled for us to walk through what is a very complicated good news passage. So here's the text. It's out of Mark chapter 2, verse 18 is where we begin. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, and people came and said to him, this being said to Jesus, why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not? Jesus said to them, the wedding guests cannot fast while the bridegroom is with them, can they? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast on that day. Jesus continued on, no one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old cloak. Otherwise, the patch pulls away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is lost, and so are the skins. But one puts new wine into fresh wineskins. Then the next story that Mark gives us is this, that one Sabbath he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And Jesus said to them, have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need of food? He entered the house of God when Abiathar was high priest and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priests to eat. And he gave some to his companions. Then Jesus said to them, The Sabbath was made for humankind, not humankind for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord of even the Sabbath. We do ask today that God add blessing and understanding to this, the reading aloud, the hearing, and most importantly for us, that God would bless our living out of these words of Scripture. So I forewarned you that this is a complicated one, and there is a history of Christian scholarly work and sort of denominational or religious belief uh, within the religion of the Christian church that, that has a whole wide variety of understanding of what it is that these particular words of Scripture compel people to live out. It has been, these, these texts have been used as both an indictment of fasting and as a way to make a case for fasting. These scriptures have been interpreted as a condemnation of the old way, of the old organization or the old people, and simultaneously have been understood as a warning about the new way, the new organization or the new people for fear that they would tear things apart. This scripture has been used to disavow following the Sabbath, which we recall is one of the Ten Commandments, and it has also been used to make the case for keeping the Sabbath, but with alterations, tailoring it to fit what a person or a particular community sees fit. 
And if you don't believe me on, I, I, I think you probably believe me, but there may be one who says, I don't know about all that, Pastor Michael. Let me give you one small example when it comes at least to that very last part about the Sabbath and how, to, how it is that God would want us to live in it. I'm taken back to uh, years ago, about close to 20 years ago in Kentucky, Katie and I were part of a church that had a connection with a local adult living facility, a senior living facility. And so uh, there was a rotation of people in that church that Katie and I were part of who would go to that facility and weekly lead a Bible study, like Sunday school class, for those who couldn't leave the facility very easily. And we had a lot of fun in that class with that group of uh, primarily older women. And one Sunday, there was a, a, a woman who very normally was just as sweet and as Kentucky sweet as you could imagine. <laughs> just a kind, syrupy woman. But there was something else kind of exuding from her. That, and you know how sometimes you can just feel it coming from a person. Now, she was, she was tense, and she wasn't quite so syrupy anymore. And... I forget what led to her sharing what was bothering her, but she finally shared it, and she said this, I'm just madder than a hornet. My neighbor Ethel has been doing laundry all morning long. And I, I kept waiting for what was making her angry. And of course, this was a Sunday morning that we were with, uh, with this group, and she was very angry that her neighbor had been doing laundry on the Sabbath. Now, by this point, I'm familiar with the Sabbath, and I'm familiar even generally with some ideas that we might have in our context, ours being kind of 21st century uh, American Christians, our context of how we understand Sabbath or kind of leave it vague in general. But I had never been encountered and honestly never thought I would find so hilarious somebody being so mad about somebody else doing laundry on a Sunday. But she was mad. And then it led to this whole eye-opening conversation with all of the people in this class about the various blue laws that either had been stated or uh, not stated, but sort of known within the particular communities that they had grown up in. These are things that you do on Sundays. These are things you don't do on Sundays. These are things that can be sold on Sundays. These are things that can't be sold on Sundays. And, and uh, communities had sort of made their own decisions uh, about what those things would be. So, maybe, maybe some of that is familiar to you. I haven't encountered any of those uh, norms here in Vero Beach just yet on a Sunday, but I tend to be busy on Sundays. I tend to be doing my own Sabbath breaking on Sundays by working on what we understand as the Lord's Day. Many of you do the same thing as you serve in the church. But, but, but let me bring us back to in light of sort of this notion of vast array of interpretation around this one particular text, uh, what is it that Jesus is trying to communicate? Because uh, Jesus is ticking off his neighbors here in Mark chapter 2. His neighbors are complaining to their Sunday school teachers, saying, you know what, I'm so bothered this morning. Jesus is doing his laundry, and that's not right. It's Sunday after all, or it's, this, it's the day for fasting after all, or it's, it's, uh, it's the day for not picking grain. So uh, it's been thousands of years of, of interpreting, and there hasn't quite been a central landing place for scholarly work, but I'm confident we can get this sorted out by lunch, so just hang with me. <laughs> this sermon's going worldwide. It'll be on the news preacher does it first time, <laughs> helps people understand Mark 2, 18 through 28. So, uh, no, I, I don't fully understand it, but I do think there are some things that God is trying to reveal to us that, that we might uh, be able to, to take heed of. So, uh, let's remember what's going on. First, the super religious that are around Jesus right now described as the Pharisees, as well as John's disciples, John the Baptist, Jesus' uh, very cousin, uh, they are fasting, and at the same time, Jesus' disciples are not fasting. Now, some of what's come out of that is an understanding of, hey, this is Jesus saying, you don't ever have to fast, 
Or there are some people who say you never had to fast while Jesus was alive in human form on earth. And um, maybe, maybe neither of those are exactly on point. You know, the, the reality is, the best that we can understand is there were several times a year when virtually all Jewish people fasted. And, and perhaps this even continues in, in some Jewish circles today. Certain periods of fast called upon by the entire community. But what the Pharisees did and what John's disciples did was kind of uh, fasting on steroids. Because a little bit of fasting is good, a lot of fasting is even better. So there were several times during the week where those disciples would fast extra. And when they approach Jesus about this and say, hey, we thought you're the holy, holy man. How come you and the people that are following you aren't fasting as much as we are? Jesus replied with uh, my paraphrase here of simply, it's just not time for that. You go on, you fast, but, but for us, it's just not the time. So then we get two metaphors from Jesus following that encounter. The first is about a patch on a cloak that ultimately tears off. And then there's a second one about wineskins that burst. The, the metaphors are not the same, but they have similar features, right? They both involve this idea of stretching. They have this, uh, this notion in them of volatility of some sort. Something has created a tear in that cloak. Uh, the, the fermenting wine, that new wine is, is, is volatile. It's releasing gases. It's expanding. It's, it's calling upon the skin holding it to stretch. And in both metaphors, we have the possibility that exists for the solution to create a bigger problem than what was started with. The beginning problem, I've got a coat with a hole in it. Let me patch it. And Jesus says, be careful about that patch. Because unless you put the right patch on that right tear, you might end up with a bigger tear. Somebody says, oh my gosh, I've got a new harvest of wine, or my neighbor does and is offering me some. This is great. Uh, how am I going to store it? I've got these old wineskins I can use. They're just lying around. And Jesus says, duh, 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 duh. be careful. That's a gift, though, that, that wine. But if you're not careful, you might lose the gift of the wine and the gift of these skins that you have had. And they might both, uh, they might both be lost. So right now, I'm, just, I'm continuing in the summary. Uh, the, the third and final part of this sequence of uh, scriptures is Jesus then on the Sabbath with his disciples. They're picking off heads of grain as they're walking through this field. And those who are paying particularly close attention to, to the law say, whoa, 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 unlawful. And Jesus responds with, well, didn't something similar to this happen in the Bible once? Was there this time where King David gave his men something to eat, and it was bread they really weren't supposed to eat. The law said, that bread isn't for you, but desperate times, desperate measures, you know, it, it's okay. So, all right, there's the summary. That's what we've talked about in the scripture. And can you see from the perspective of why there is such a wide array of not only interpretation with this, but really a tendency to want to set the whole thing off to the side. Uh, be, not that we would ever do that intentionally, but this, like, for example, this is a scripture I've never preached before <laughs> because I haven't wanted to preach it because the preacher's supposed to get up and say, here's what the Bible says and what it means and go and do. And uh, I, I can't tell you exactly what that is here. So it, 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 it challenges and stretches all of us as we think about this. And Jesus didn't give us something crystal clear, black and white. Hey, in this situation, do this exactly. And in this situation, do this other thing. Instead, we get some version of things have changed. We get some version of the norms that you have known are not necessarily the norms anymore. And that those messages go against every one of our physical instincts, uh, younger and older. We all have this instinct physically and I think even mentally, emotionally toward homeostasis. You're familiar with that term, right? That, that, that means in the physiological sense, uh, if you would just reset my temperature to 98.6, everything will be great. Because the body is craving to be at that 
at that temperature it needs to be at to be able to function. And so you play that out in a whole bunch of ways. What that means is we like when we're, we like what we know, we like what is comfortable, and we want to return always to what we have understood as normal. And throughout human history, there's never been an ability to return to what was normal. There's only the ability to live into a new normal because everything is changing. Everyone is changing all the time. And again, this can be very disconcerting across the board of of age, of location, of whatever it is, where, whenever and wherever you are, the idea of change being inevitable is a very difficult reality most often for us. Colossians 3, or not Colossians, pardon me, 2 Corinthians 3.18 says this about the constant state of change that is happening among people and among this kingdom on earth that God is transforming into the kingdom as it is in heaven. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, we are being transformed from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord. We are always in the process of being transformed. It is the Spirit of God working in this world, always saying, there's somewhere else that we are going. There's some place new. And a lot of times we say, I like it right here. I am good, thank you. I finally got everything figured out. The preacher even figured it all out before lunch. Let's, let's just go get our lunch on and we're good. So I, I, with this in mind, I got stuck in my head earlier this week, this uh, line from an ancient Greek philosopher. Some of you may be familiar with it. The, the line is this, uh, no one ever steps in the same river twice, for it's not the same river and neither is the person. Now, that was 1,500 years ago somebody thought of that. And I said, well, that's... File that one away. No one ever steps in the same river twice. The river is changed. The waters are moving. And so it is also for the person who stands in the river. So this led me to going down a little bit of a Google search rabbit hole about the river in our backyard, at least here uh, on, on Gray Twig and A1A, this river, the Indian River. And very quickly in my Google searching, and I say this to only share what I as a newbie know, all of you I think probably that are here know this stuff already, uh, but I found out it's not even a river. That's a bit of falseness in advertising. It's technically the Indian River Lagoon, and it's really not river at all, it's, it's all lagoon. But that doesn't necessarily flow as easily off the tongue. So anyway, we're with Indian River or Indian River Lagoon, but it's a lagoon meaning that it, it among other things, that it doesn't always flow in one direction that you know, this body of water is being poured into by other bodies of water, and sometimes it goes north, sometimes it goes south, sometimes it doesn't go any direction at all. It just sits nice and flat. It, it depends on the wind, right? And it depends on what the tides do. It's an amazingly diverse body of water. You've got this fresh water flowing in, you've got the salt water coming from the ocean, and they're in the middle in this very unique kind of setup that exists for this uh, Boy, I think I read that it's, it's over 100 miles long, the lagoon is, or maybe that, no, well, don't quote me on that. It's long is the point. It, it's a long body of water, and it's got this, uh, you know, it, this area surrounding it. it. It is able to house an extraordinary number of, of sort of unique species, whether they be creepy crawl, crawly creatures or things that live in, in its waters. It's a really special place. And... For the thousands of years that it has existed, it has always been changing, and it's maybe never changed more than the last hundred years as we have started to arrive and populate. And so there's, there's some good things that come from that. We're, we're not all bad. There's some good things we do to help the lagoon, but there's also a whole lot of runoff that comes into the lagoon causing it issues in terms of its health and its sustainability. So needless to say, you can never step in the same Indian River Lagoon in the same spot twice, right? You never step in that, that river or that lagoon where it is the same today as it was yesterday. And, and again, so it is for me and for you. Uh, I had the chance to meet recently with Stu. Stu is the executive director of the Youth Sailing Foundation, who also happens to be part of Christ by the Sea, along with his wife, Diane. And uh, Stu was generous in his time with me and gave me a little bit of an overview of the Youth Sailing Foundation along with 
uh, because he's plugged into this work, the general landscape of nonprofit work in Vero Beach. It was an inspiring time I spent with him. It was thrilling. My hunch is that there are a few things in this world that make Stu more happy than getting to tell somebody who doesn't know about the Youth Sailing Foundation about it. So if any of you haven't, find Stu and he'll tell you about it. Um, and, and you will be thankful that you have heard about it. So, so in the midst of these stories I heard, as Stu told me that their ultimate goal isn't about making sailors, although they make those, but it's not making professional yachts people. It's, it's forming lives of young people, and it's giving opportunity to young people who may not normally have these sorts of opportunities and, and all the good outgrowths that come from that. And, and at one point during the, the sharing and the presenting that Stu was doing with me, he showed me a picture and it was a picture where he was describing to me how the kids who were in that uh, program are not only learning to sail, but they're learning about the ecology of the Indian River Lagoon. And they're not only learning about it, but they're being invited slash kind of made to help in the care of that lagoon. And so I saw this picture of kids uh, knee deep or thigh deep in water and muck. And Stu was telling me a bit about how there's a lot of muck in parts of this river, how there's a lot that needs to happen, continue to happen, so that life can again be flourishing on the bottom of, the, or, or of, the bottom of this uh, body of water. The river is always changing, and the people, even the generations who are stepping into it, they're always changing too. And there are decisions to be made for those people stepping into the river about the river itself and about their place in it. Would you think that it's possible for people of different generations and different norms to ever share the same space in an ever-changing river, in an ever-changing world? Find Stu sometime and ask him, Stu, is it possible that those of Generation Baby Boomer are sharing the same space with Generation XYZ, one of those, and... And y'all are not, uh, you know, tearing each other apart, but, but you're finding through this, this kind of work, you're finding change that comes not only for the student, but for the teacher, for the mentor. Are you finding bridge building that's happening? Are you finding the betterment of the very river that you stand in? Talk to Stu, and he'll tell you powerful stories about how boats in the water are changing both the people and the environment in which they are in. So, part of what I can give you, and take it, uh, hold it, you know, loosely as you will do anyway, and you will discern for yourself what it is the preacher might or might not be saying, but I believe that Jesus, through these passages, is trying to move us somewhere to a similar idea. That, yeah, in a world full of change and of different perspectives and different generations, that we have to be careful about it, and it's difficult. Be, be aware of the dangers, but know that it's possible for those people to bridge, to, for bridges to be built between these people, by these people. Uh, this was, I believe, my second sermon here, or my first. I've already been here so long, my sermons are blending together. But it, <laughs> if it's happening for me, I know it's happening for you. But I spoke in one of these sermons about how the, the root of the word priest comes from bridge builder. And we're called to be a kingdom of priests, a kingdom of bridge builders between generations, between people of all kind of sizes and shapes and sorts and perspectives. That, that Jesus in these scriptures is calling us once again and trying to say, here's a little bit that you need to know about bridge building. It stretches you. You can't build a bridge without venturing off of the, the shore and into the water. You can't build a bridge without meeting somebody else where they are at. You can't come with others if the others are exactly the same. Everybody is different always, and so are we. The river is changing, and I am too. There's uncomfortability. There's the acknowledgement of different norms, and there is also there can be a mutual commitment to each other's thriving, a mutual commitment to a cloak minimizing its tear, a mutual commitment to wineskins that do not have to burst, ruining wine and wineskins all at the same time. 
So uh, I mentioned to you at the beginning of this uh, sermon about this commitment to preaching the good news. And, and so it was over a month ago that I was mapping out these Sundays. Lord, what do you want me to, to focus in on on these Sundays? And uh, I am reminded in moments like this that God's bird's eye view of seeing what is down the road is a little bit better than the human perspective that I have. Uh, I say this to share that you'll be receiving a letter this week from the Christ by the Sea uh, United Methodist Church Church Council about the, the stretching and the difficulty going on within the greater United Methodist Church. Some of you are keenly aware of this, some of you middle aware of it, and some of you barely aware at all, to which a lot of us are envious. And say, so how did you manage to not be aware of this at all? Uh, nevertheless, uh, it, is, it is a reality within the church, and it's a reality that is stretching and pulling at Christ by the sea, United Methodist Church as well. So it, it was a few days into my time as your pastor that I was in a meeting with some church leaders, and those church leaders shared, hey, this stretching and kind of pulling that's happening, it's got to be addressed. It's got to be addressed here at the church. Like it is, it is serious and it is urgent. And so the conversations continued over the, the subsequent weeks with other church leaders, and, and numerous of the leaders said similar things. Hey, the people here in this church, we're we're at a place that we can't deal with the, the stretching and the pulling any longer. We've got to figure out who we are and where we're going and what we're going to do. And so those meetings kind of led then to last week to church council and the leaders of this church who you trust and I trust getting there and saying, we agree. We recognize that, that there is something that has to be discerned in the midst of this uh, by these people. So the letter that you're going to get is sort of the opening communication of trying to start entering into what the, what the council understands as a direct process. Direct meaning we're mindful of it, we are mapping it out, we are trying to do all that we can so that the people of the church know the possibilities that lie ahead. And as the United Methodist Church is structured, it will be the people, it'll be you, the members, who decide this is who we are and this is who we will be in light of all that we see uh, happening in the denomination and in the world. Uh, I'll be honest with you, I'll be transparent with you throughout the process and our church council will be too because really it's your process. We're called on by God and elected by you to facilitate such process, but it's your process. So we'll be transparent with you in that. And part of my transparency is to share with you this is not what I envisioned uh, as I came on board at this church in the sense of I, I, did, I was not aware that the waters were sort of bubbling this much about this. And it's not necessarily the way that I would have chosen to say during these first weeks and months of my pastorate uh, for this to be sort of what it has been, which is the number one issue that I have uh, sort of been engaged in in my pastoral work in the church. Nevertheless, uh, that doesn't change the reality just because I didn't expect it of what is. Uh, the river is always changing. The people are always changing. I'm always changing. And these are the realities of where things are right now. Uh, what I do believe is that Jesus can handle it. What I do believe is that Jesus will be walking with us, guiding us as we listen to be able to navigate it ourselves with the spirit that Jesus gives us. I believe that as Jesus offered these metaphors about cloaks and patches and wine and wineskins, that Jesus wasn't offering these metaphors to say, hey, and here's what you can expect, and this is actually what I want, is for tearing and breaking apart. I think Jesus is trying to say, these are realities that, that may exist among you, and boys, you've gotta walk into it carefully because what could result is the losing of everything. So, so don't rush, but, but carefully examine what you're doing. And that's what we'll do together. I believe that, that Jesus, in a spirit of truth and love, wants to walk us through what this chapter is going to be for this church. And I'm still very hopeful about this chapter and the chapters that are yet to come. I believe 
pastorally. This is, this is not something that can be instituted. It can only be a posture that I hold. But I believe, and what I've experienced with you all, is that we are a church that welcomes everybody into what Richard Foster calls the with God life. Hey, if, if you have anything in you at all that says God feels over there from a distance, you know, God is the Bette Midler song, and I don't like that. I don't want God to be off in a distance watching anymore. I want God to be close. We're a people who say, man, you found the place. You are amongst of God with seekers as well. We also want God to be close. We want to be walking in the light of God's love and where God is leading. Uh, that, that I believe can and will be true about this congregation, not only in these coming months, but in the coming years that we are part of a community at Christ by the sea seeking to live with God and to live with one another. And that Jesus, the one thing that he was clear on over and over again about what that looks like is that it's rooted in love. And so we will proceed in love as well. There will be a lot more uh, communication around this, a lot of conversation. It's not like something is happening next week and you're like, what did Michael say? I was sleeping, but I heard something. And next week the doors are gonna be closed. That's not it at all. Uh, we'll, we, will, we will breathe together and walk together. I'll, of course, be available weekly uh, here on Sundays and at other times if you wish to speak. Our church council members have that same openness and availability to you. So uh, that part of the sermon I had not planned on when I started mapping it out weeks ago, but I think it was an important one for, uh, for us to share. Hopefully, as you receive that letter, the letter makes a little more sense now to you. Uh, but... In light of how this Sunday has, um, uh, or is, is scheduled and mapped out in the ritual of this church, it's, it's Healing Sunday. And we're reminded when we think about this stretching and pulling within our church community in the broader denomination, the reality is each one of us have things in our lives that are doing that same sort of stretch and pull on us. Uh, whether it is diagnoses, whether it is emotional strain of some sort, anger, loneliness, sadness. Maybe it's somebody we know and love and care about deeply. We have on our hearts things which burden us that this church, praise God, has said in this particular way, there's a, there is a way and an avenue for you to share that burden, to, to share it with God, and if it feels too heavy to give to God, why don't you let one of us lift it up with you? So the invitation will be in just a moment uh, to come forward to the altar rail as you are able. And I will be up here and I'm going to invite Joe and Joanne to join me. And the three of us just will uh, come to you as you kneel or if you're standing at the altar rail and say, uh, how can we pray for you? And you'll tell us real briefly, pray for dot, dot, dot. And then we'll have this little cup of oil that we will uh, touch onto your forehead as an outward sign of an inward reality that God is present with you in that heaviness, that God is working toward hope and healing and wholeness. We'll say a prayer for you. And we'll, we'll go through as many folks who want to come forward. If you're not able to come forward, but you'd like us to come to you, we're very happy to do that. Just kind of convey to an usher, they'll be, or I'm assuming uh, one or two will be standing around in the go over and wave and say, hey, send one of them over to me and we'll come to you. And, uh, and then we will sing together and we'll praise God and we'll keep on living in this ever-changing river as we ourselves are being changed. And we will pray that the change would be from glory into glory, just as Second Corinthians says. Well, as